Council member Camus is coming back from the event, so uh, just two minutes? Two minutes, all right. So I, I do want to make one quick announcement for those interested. Uh, the City of Fremont is going to have a technology symposium uh, for elected officials and IT executives June 5th from 10 to 2 p.m. at Fremont City Hall. So um, you can certainly ask me if you have questions. Uh, you can come ping me or, or uh, ask me during a break. So while we're waiting for uh, Councilmember Camus, I think I'll go ahead and do some. Oh, Johnny, thanks for coming back. So I'm just going to do the introductions. Uh, this is the Mayor's Panel on Smart Cities. Our moderator is going to be Madison Wen, who is former Vice Mayor of San Jose and with the Silicon Valley Organization, which is the Chamber of Commerce for San Jose. Also, um, we have Mayor Lily May from Fremont. Uh, Mayor May cannot stay for the entire time, but we do thank her for, for being here. We have um, Michelle Wu, uh, Vice Mayor of Los Altos Hills. Right. Um, we have Newell Arnerich, who is the mayor of Danville, John Marchand, the mayor of Livermore. We have Ben Bartlett, who is the uh, council member of Berkeley, former vice mayor of Berkeley. We have Anthony Fan of Milpitas Councilman. We have Benny Lee of San Leandro Councilman. And, of course, our host again, Johnny Camus, council member of City San Jose. Big round of applause. I think I said Anthony's name really quickly, and I said Benny. Who did I miss? I, no. no, I got no. I got no. So, tell me Danny resident, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, Madison, thanks again. Kick it off. And uh, are we doing Q and A or? No, no. Uh, yeah. I am going to ask each mayor uh, and elected official up here to spend two minutes to introduce themselves, talk about their city. This is your chance to promote any great things that you're doing in your city. So we will start with our host, Councilmember Johnny Camus, with the city of San Jose. Thank you, thank you. And I, um, I'm actually miss working with the former vice mayor. She, she was a, a great asset to the community, and she's a great asset to the the, the Silicon Valley organization. Uh, San Jose is on the rise. Uh, many of you know, you have, you've heard the, some good news about Google coming to San Jose, but there's a lot of other opportunities happening. In fact, there's, uh, there's a brand new federal program called an Opportunity Zone, which allows for uh, tax-free investment in lower, uh, lower income areas and, and to, to provide jobs in lower income areas. This is a federal tax program that we are launching with partners like Urban Catalyst, um, and so there's a lot of zones in San Jose that if you locate your business, you will actually get federal tax incentives. There, we have tax-free zones. We have all kinds of opportunities to do business in San Jose. In fact, we have an entire department uh, focused on bringing and attracting businesses to the city of San Jose. And we've been proud of a lot of the work that, have, that they have done. Uh, besides uh, Google, of course, uh, Adobe is, is doubling the size of their campus. Uh, Microsoft is locating in northern San Jose. HP uh, E is locating their headquarters as we grand opened it the other day. Um, many other uh, Roku, Roku is uh, is uh, locating on on the uh, west side of the airport. So a lot of companies have found their way to San Jose, and we welcome anybody uh, who wants to come and learn why San Jose is such a competitive and great place to locate your business. We welcome you to come. My office is always open for any questions. Uh, again, I'm the head of the Economic Development Committee and I'm proud to host this distinguished panel uh, every year. Thank you all for being here and coming and, and uh, being part of this event. Thank you, Councilmember Camus. Uh, to my left here is Councilmember Bartlett with the City of Berkeley. Uh, oh, okay. oh, thank you, thank you. It's such wonderful chambers. I'm used to our chambers in Berkeley, which are from the last century. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here right now, and uh, I love um, what your, your work here in San Jose, uh, really cutting edge. And, you know, some of the city council in Berkeley, and in Berkeley, we, we sort of have three hallmarks to our, our approach to the future, and it's innovation, opportunity, and um, and, uh, <laughs> and I'll think of the third one later. But essentially, we, we like to innovate in order to address social problems and problems of our day, and then we open up that innovation to create opportunity for all people that, so they can be included in it. So to that end, um, we, we recently have been working hard on 
creating um, a health innovation zone in the city of Berkeley to leverage technology providers and healthcare providers to address new forms of care. Um, and then also leveraging all the major, uh, co major corporations as well as university. And then also we, we last year we created um, the first uh, municipal bond program leveraging blockchain technology, uh, these crypto bonds or micro bonds I call them. Uh, and this is to, to target investment for affordable housing and infrastructure needs, but making the bonds accessible to ordinary people to lower the cost of acquisition down to one dollar or five dollars. This, in one sense, is meant to drive prosperity and also address capital needs. Uh, another thing we're doing is um, is creating um, a, a regime for robotics. We're leveraging labor and robots together, so creating a new sort of permit regimes that unite uh, those two opposing forces that young people can work uh, in the robotics industry. Um, another thing coming up is our opportunity zone. We all are also leveraging uh, the opportunity zones that exist in Berkeley and creating an overlay district, a special set of rules for the opportunity zone that leverage uh, opportunity inclusion and technology. So we're really excited to just kind of continue uh, everything we're working on. And this summer, my office will be, let, will be introducing a uh, carbon tax in Berkeley to fund uh, free electric transportation for all residents. So that's buses, scooters, cars, uh, you name it. And so powering the infrastructure to develop EV infrastructure via car, a local carbon tax. So we, we believe in innovation and uh, it's good to see partners here with you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as a moderator, I I'm, I'm need to keep us moving along. So two minutes, you will have time during the discussion to talk about some of the other initiatives. So we can keep this for two minutes so that we can get into the question. I would really appreciate that. Uh, to my right here, we have the Deputy uh, Mayor of the Town of Danville, Noel Arnorich. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, San Jose, again, for hosting such a great event. Uh, Danville is probably next to Los Alta Hills, probably the smallest city um, that's represented here. But we're pretty unique. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about that on our Smart City Initiatives and our Smart Quarter, which would be the first in the Bay Area. Uh, we're founded back in 1858. We're a town of 43,000 people. Um, we have two zip codes. One of our zip codes is the highest per capita income in the United States with that zip code. Uh, we're also a city that has the least amount of revenue per capita of probably most of our cities. Um, so we have people who believe they pay lots of taxes and they should get lots of services and we have big challenges to be able to deal with that. Um, the other thing that I think you find about our community is that there are more software companies start in Danville than they do any place else in the Bay Area. And you would ask yourself why in this little historic community where our city hall, by the way, is 100 years old and it's about a, it would fit in this corner over here. It's because the people that live, the overwhelming majority of the people, all work in Silicon Valley. And they're tired of driving. And they started on the side developing these software companies and there's only one that's remained there once it gets over about 30 to 40 to 50 people. They need to move to our cities out in Tri Valley um, because we simply don't have the space. Um, one of those uh, companies that did stay is called Trove, um, T R O V. Uh, it's an interesting company that's um, uh, now listed. Um, it's um, still headquartered in Danville, um, a company of uh, about 800 employees. They're not all in Danville. Exciting. Um, look forward to in a few minutes to be able to talk to you about how smart cities can start in small cities and be successful. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and next we have uh, Vice Mayor of Los Altos Hills, Michelle Wu. Uh, yes, hi. Um, thanks for inviting me here. I am probably the smallest fish in the pond. I came here really eye-opening, learning the San Jose, Fremont, all these big city, and also even smaller city like Bengal has a economic growth. Los Altos Hills has 2,800 single-family house, 8.5 square miles, that's pretty much what I can say. I really got nothing to promote. <laughs> we have no library, no school, uh, no police force. We contract with uh, county sheriff. Uh, so really, we don't have a, even a single Starbucks in our town. Um, but the reason I'm sitting here not promote me to uh, uh, talk about is the broadband connection, the internet, uh, the access. Even though uh, one day I saw on the, uh, the newspaper, uh, I think it's New York Times, said that Los Altos Hill is the second most expensive zip code, 
uh, in the country, then I was thinking, well, yeah, it's kind of like a wealthy, you got lots of money, but we are very, very poor on the broadband access. Uh, we don't have fiber connection. If you check on the internet, then AT&T Verizon does not offer that. So my goal is how are we going to bring the 5G or uh, gigabit internet speed to the rural communities? And larger, on the higher level, is how are we going to bridge the digital divide between the urban and the rural America? That is what my mission that I wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, up next, we have uh, Councilmember Benny Lee from the city of San Leandro. Well, you can get back to me because I know Mayor uh, May has to run off to an event, so I'm going to yield some time to her. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone's understanding. I apologize. So thank, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about the city of Fremont. I'm Mayor May, and it gives me great pleasure to give a little bit of introduction. We're here and very fortunate. Thank you for our host, San Jose, and for Johnny Camus for their support, as well as Silicon Valley Lead uh, Chinese Technical Business Association for their leadership in pulling us together. So Fremont's the fourth largest city in the Bay Area in terms of population, and the second largest, actually, in land mass, only to San Jose, our, our big neighbor next door. Uh, but we're very fortunate, most importantly, to be home to such diverse technology and opportunities. Some of you may know that we are um, home to a lot of advanced manufacturing. We have over 900 manufacturers, and we uh, specifically specialize in biomedical, um, clean tech, biotech, um, as well as EVs. Um, we're, home, as I mentioned, home to Tesla, and that manufacturing is expanding from 4.5 million, uh, million to 10 million square feet. Um, we also are home to other disruptive technologies, such as Facebook is about to build their other bookend campus. But when I think about smart cities and what we're talking about today, I was saying earlier that it's not just the technologies that we're looking at, it's the ways that we're implementing those and the ways that we can share stories and partner. Um, for small cities and big cities alike, I think that you can look at it from how we design everything, how we implement traffic flow. And so while, Michelle, you may not have um, the, the businesses, I think that how we are thoughtful and how we build our infrastructure. So earlier when Ben, you were saying what would be three eyes, I'd say uh, innovation, inclusion, and also infrastructure. And that's something that I just came back from Washington, D.C. and talking about the state of the cities. And so many of our mayors and council members all agree those are the key areas. Two projects I really appreciate your time and letting me share a little bit about before I'm going to another um, welcoming of a new business in Fremont. Um, is we, we think that it's an opportunity, and I know Johnny has stressed this in the past too, to be pioneers and to be thoughtful in how we include some of the technology in, in implementing that as we build our um, services. So for example, many of you saw last year there was concerns with natural disasters, be it forest fires, be it earthquakes. And so when we were looking at our fire stations, three of our 11 fire stations, when we're implementing processes, we were also implementing ability to microgrid. So that allows us to have solar energy, but in case of a natural disaster, for allowing us to be responsive in the most critical time periods to our residents and citizens. And we also try to utilize the technology that's within our cities. And so we partner with our companies, so it's a public-private partnership. And I think that that makes this attractive when it looks at future opportunities, such as our opportunity zones, and we're building our downtown and our spine and our network. Um, it's those policies that when it comes to building housing, you were talking about, you mostly are residential, that we think about processes or implementation of guidelines for our design, um, for implementing solar ready, um, and looking at how we're building, for example, in Fremont, we also have a lot of transit-oriented development over 5,600 units of transit-oriented development. And when you're building those, how do we look at how many people are now doing transit demand, um, you know, in terms of Uber and Lyfts, and so building those spaces so you can pick up and drop off. Um, and finally, I think even for one of our more famous case studies that happened this past year is we also are uh, just recently launched our Tesla patrol car. and. Um, when I was in D.C., many people were calling Tesla saying, we're, we were part of the pilot, and I go, it wasn't Tesla program, it's actually a city of Fremont program. And so it was something where we wanted to see, as we're building our fleet and replacing them, you know, what are the opportunities that we could pilot and see the efficiencies of not just purchasing the car, but the long-term maintenance and the efficiencies of, 
of running that type of vehicle. So hopefully we'll have a good story to come back and tell you in a year. But it is a working functional vehicle that we had outfitted. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from all the other panelists. I apologize for sharing a little bit more of my time, but I hope that to have this continued discussion with all of my fellow neighboring cities, whether it's on transportation, housing, infrastructure and solutions, there's no way that we can do it individually, but certainly in partnership with all of you as fellow electeds and also in working with all of the companies and initiatives that are here. This is an opportunity for us to bet, um, bet on better practices and to help us implement solutions that will work for us as we move the cities and our economies forward. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mayor. Today, uh, now we'll go back to Councilman Billy. Well, thank you, and you know, I, I want to thank also the SV CTBA as well as all of my colleagues for sharing their thoughts because those thoughts are actually contributed to my thoughts as well. Uh, I'm from the city of San Leandro. Uh, I say I moonlight as a councilman because my day job is with the County of San Mateo, and my boss was one of the keynote speakers, John Walton. Uh, so the city of San Leandro has a population of 90,000, and in 2014, it was actually ranked the fourth most diverse city uh, in the nation with a population of 50,000 and greater. And I can tell you the diversity because we did a, um, a gap analysis study and half of the city, 51% uh, English was a second language or not an option at all. So diversity is very important, inclusion is very important, and also leveraging technology to the best uh, of our ability is important. We have a number of projects just like the other cities. We have Marina Shoreline project, which is probably a half half a billion dollar project. We have opportunity zones where we're going to redo the uh, Bay Fair uh, shopping area to probably over 2,000 housing units as well as a village marketplace. Uh, we're looking at changing our um, the way we do our streets so that way we, it's more multimodal, uh, safer for the bikes, but safe, safer for alternative uh, modes of transportation. Uh, when we're talking about spark cities, I think it's very important because you have basically three uh, primary dimensions that you have to work with. Policy, because you have to develop a policy specifically for uh, technology, because of the fact that you need to start using the technology, technology that will help save time for your staff, and of course multipliers, and uh, third, the framework. Um, building out the network, whether it's wired, wireless, and the technologies that tie to it. So I look forward to hearing from all my colleagues on this. Thank you. Um, up next, we have the mayor of Livermore, John Mushan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Livermore is a city of uh, superlatives and contrasts. We are California's oldest commercial wine region with the cutting edge of technology. It is where technologies uh, that are used to operate smart cities are developed. Uh, we're home to two world-class national laboratories, Lawrence Livermore and Sandia National Laboratories, with the Combustion Research Facility and the Biofuel Research Facility. We have one of the world's fastest supercomputers and the world's fastest rodeo, uh, which is also going to be uh, June 8th and 9th. Uh, Livermore has the world's most powerful laser, uh, which is the National Ignition Facility, and when it fires, it creates more energy than being used across the entire United States. 500 trillion watts. Its goal is to strike the match to light the sun. We also have the world's longest continuously burning light bulb, which is burning for 118 years. Uh, and we're one of only six cities in the world to have an element named after us and have our name appear on the periodic table of elements. Uh, element uh, 116, uh, Livermorium, was not discovered, it was created by scientists from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, and the Flair Institute in Russia. Uh, we are a community of 91,000 residents, but we're an integral part of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area in the Tri-Valley. Uh, we're powered by a wealth of research, technology, and innovation. We have a highly skilled workforce. Uh, we have a, a regional incubator, uh, which is funded by the cities of Pleasanton, Livermore, Danville, uh, and uh, Dublin. And that's uh, also with the two national laboratories, creating technologies uh, and creating new businesses within the region. We've also attracted uh, world-class manufacturers like Gillig, Draxel Meyer, Tesla, and Topcon. I recently watched as a site was mapped by an unmanned drone with the 3D, 3D images sent to a computer and then onto an unmanned uh, grader, which then created the site within one millimeter. Uh, it's Livermore is where the world looks to solve its most difficult problems. It's a great place to be, a great place to be mayor. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, and last but not least, we have Councilmember Anthony Vaughn from the City of Milpitas. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, city of Milpitas, we're a growing city, um, and we welcome the growth. Um, we have a uh, bar, we have light rail, um, and we're, you know, proud of the growth. Uh, we welcome your businesses and your investments. We're going through uh, our general plan update uh, where we will uh, be designating opportunity zones and special uh, areas where there will be uh, incentives uh, for businesses to uh, locate. Uh, we lowered our uh, development fees. Um, there's room for uh, development in Milpitas. Um, we, we're changing our um, permit per permitting process, making it streamlined, making it easier for you to come. Uh, it shouldn't be um, a, a headache for you to do business in Milpitas. So, um, you know, that's, I'll just keep it short there. Thank you. So now we're gonna go, uh, I have a couple questions uh, that I'm supposed to ask, and then I'll probably uh, have some follow-up questions depending on how, um, depending on your answer. So since we started on the left, let's just start on the right with the young um, council member from Milpitas. Uh, the first question is, has your city adopted uh, smart technology initiatives or any kind of technologies around smart city? If so, what are, if you can share with the audience uh, some of the, the key ones and, and what are some of the results? So I, I think um, we've adopted um, some of the infrastructure for smart cities, um, with uh, beginning with uh, some of our uh, traffic cameras. Um, but the road to uh, being a smart city, I think, is still going to be a long one for us. Um, right now, our economic development department uh, will be working to uh, come back with uh, a study that, um, in order for us to, uh, you know, later. Um, and down the road, uh, we hope to reach out to um, our uh, neighboring um, municipalities and uh, seeing what everybody else has been doing in uh, incorporating uh, these policies. Um, you know, we are home to uh, great companies like Cisco, and um, you know, in uh, conversations with them, they have also um, highlighted some of the great work that they're doing in terms of uh, smart transportation um, and um, the smart uh, infrastructure. How do we integrate that into uh, our in public infrastructure? Yeah, thank you. Mayor uh, Michelle? <coughs> there we go. So a little bit more like uh, uh, many small cities, uh, we're not leading the charge on the adoption of uh, smart city uh, technologies. Uh, Smart cities with limited budgets, uh, we don't become a smart city just for the sake of being able to call ourselves a, small, a smart city. Uh, but while we're not leading in the adoption of these technologies, Livermore is leading in the research and the development of those technologies. Um, we have two national laboratories, as I mentioned before, and our uh, state-recognized innovation hub uh, called iGate, and we have the, uh, the Switch Labs. Uh, we have entrepreneur support, uh, that allows startups and with civic applications uh, to easily connect with local government uh, and also our related partners with beta testing uh, and potential customers. Uh, Terravion uh, is a company that came out of our iGate uh, and they fly uh, over agricultural areas to determine the health of those areas. They partnered with our Wine Growers Association and we're also working with Buzz Kill Labs. You gotta love that one. Uh, they're creating uh, uh, field cannabis testing to see if people are driving impaired and they're working with our uh, uh, Livermore Police Department. Uh, since our top priority is public safety, we're also employing technologies such as license plate readers uh, to, and real-time traffic control uh, to improve the quality of life for our residents. Thank you. So, you know, I think I will name my grandchild after Buzzkill. I think that's such a great name, right? <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, so, uh, yeah, Sam, Sam Leandro, you know, per my conversation earlier, uh, in 2017, we had basically adopted the smart city uh, policy, but then that uh, has a lot of, uh, a lot more dimensions because we talked about adopting technologies. We pushed for public Wi-Fi uh, 
when I first got elected, and now we uh, just implemented uh, nine more sites this year, which actually bridges the digital divide. You need to have connectivity, and you need to connect those who are underserved in order to be a smart city. But then smart cities, just as council member uh, Fan just mentioned, it's a longer road. You have to start building a framework. So uh, one of the things that we did in 2012 was we entered in a public-private partnership with OSI Soft to put in 11 miles of fiber. That allowed us to do a, uh, a grant, a federal grant that actually extended that fiber network to over 20 miles. That's the first stage. You built the network. Now you have actually have to incorporate other connectivity technologies like wireless. And we're in that uh, framework right now where we deliver our Wi-Fi signals from a tower on top of the hill to nine different locations. The next uh, step, of course, we haven't gotten there yet, is uh, getting uh, a lot of data, matching all the data together, and improving the outcomes that will help uh, our cities, help the residents of our cities, and also uh, tagging on what Councilmember Fan said, it's a regional effort. We really need to get together and solve the problem, not just as a microcosm of our own city, but really partner together uh, with the cities adjacent to <clears throat> the, the uh, Bay Coast site. The, the further East Bay, as well as the peninsula. Vice Mayor. So um, we, when I became the uh, council member in 2016, I started the uh, emerging technology uh, ad hoc committee in our town. And that time, we didn't have much of the uh, um, uh, technology initiative. So I was really excited. And I said, well, let's make Los Angeles the smartest city of the, <laughs> the country. And then, so I have this ad hoc committee, we have like 12 people and everybody was so enthusiastic, but then we kind of come down to say, well, with all these smart city uh, application, we need the infrastructure, which is broadband infrastructure. And we have evaluated and we just don't have adequate broadband infrastructure layout. So we focused on the, um, the, the internet connection or broadband access. But that still kind of hit a big roadblock. I'm learning that as I was in on the uh, on the committee. We have neighboring city that in the more of a rural atmosphere, or even Atherton Woodside. Uh, they all have similar uh, problem. Is that the, we don't have an adequate broadband connection, namely fiber. We can't get. A, vendor like Verizon and HT to pull the fiber into our town because of the certain terrains and the very low housing density. Until today, there's no fiber uh, offered in throughout town. And we'll also have about 100 uh, houses doesn't even have the internet uh, uh, connection, the wire connection. So um, I would say that, that we are moving forward on the, on the infrastructure. But uh, we are one of the city that uh, was uh, certified by DMV uh, um, uh, to allow Waymo to test in our town, the Waymo uh, autonomous driving in our town. The other initiative that uh, I think the town sheriff, because we contract with the Santa Clara Sheriff, and they installed the ALPR, automatic license reader, on their vehicle. Because we didn't pass, we didn't have the, uh, uh, the installation in our streets, so they have the um, ALPR install the vehicles so when they drive around that they are able to scan the license reader. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? So we've, uh, Danville took a little different approach. We started 10 years ago with a smart city master plan. And the reason why we did is we had to. I mentioned uh, we had the highest per capita income, but we did the least amount of revenue. We approached it from the, from the ability to provide a greater engagement with our local citizenry, to provide better engagement with our businesses, and do it in the most cost-effective way. So it started with an infrastructure, putting in the backbone, simple things, like we had to connect all of our traffic lights. They were all independently operated, and we didn't know what they were doing. We also realized that we needed, we thought about doing uh, a free Wi-Fi system. We have connectivity to virtually every single home, so we don't have some of the social economic issues of access. But what we didn't have was high-speed um, fiber lines. We went to AT&T's and all those private companies and realized the best thing we can do is install it ourselves. So we designed a plan, had it installed by contractors. And the advantage of doing that is, is we don't have any bandwidth restrictions. We've connected every facility, going to our schools, going to our libraries, going to all of our buildings. 
We have three solar generation sites. We go to those sites. It controls all of our water systems in terms of we have we reduced our water consumption in the city by 40%. Um, we have taken the engagement to one step level. It's not just the infrastructure. It's not just our traffic lights. Our signal lights are all connected. We're also just on the next phase where we're changing all the equipment. Those loop detectors are a valuable source of information. They're all on the ground. Every city we have them. What you don't get is the information. How many cars went through there? How many cars were waiting at any given nanosecond? The new controllers, same box, same protocols, are smart connectors. If you have a fiber connection to there, it can go back to a software system that on demand, like when our freeway, Highway 680, gets backed up, people jump off onto our local streets, grid locks, and our traffic signals cannot respond to that. The new software systems will do real-time data collection, also on brand metering and all of that system we tie together. In addition, I'm fortunate that I get to sit on our regional transportation agency, and Dan Hill, San Ramon, and Alamo got selected to be the first city in California to have a smart corridor. So the freeway will change. There'll be signs all the way along, overhead signs at every quarter of a mile. It will tell you per lane what event is happening, what speed you should be going, should you move over to the next lane to clear because something's going, and it will meter that traffic. That's, that's going to help probably our biggest problem, which is traffic and goods and services movement. And the last one is in engagement is, again, we don't have the source resources and the staff, so we developed an app called Danville Connect that allows our citizens to tell us everything that's going on in the community. Gives us GPS coordinates, gives us a photograph. It tells us robustly in real time what's happening. They get a response within a couple of minutes. It makes sure that it goes to a specific employee. You have to make sure our fear was, do we, can we back that system up? Can we respond and keep up to it? So we released it quietly eight years ago, and now it's one of our most robust communication systems. So smart city, it, for a small city, it's easy because the infrastructure is easier. It is saving us tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And in our case, it's the only solution, but it's making our city a better place to live. Thank you. Council Member? Thank you. Well, uh, surprisingly, uh, Berkeley, for being uh, such a place known for innovation, we are uh, markedly behind the times in terms of our, our updating our infrastructure in general. Um, so what we have done, though, we have connected our traffic flow through smart lights. Uh, we just recently adopted license reading uh, vendors to help us to help us navigate parking. Um, <laughs> uh, we do we do have smart kiosks coming. These will be in the, in the tourist areas and their restaurants to help people navigate uh, business specials and theater. Uh, but we do have the the, 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 the we believe the first microgrid in the country. This is a connected group of municipal buildings who have their own battery supply, energy systems, and water in the event of um, a need for resilience. Um, and coming up, we are exploring mesh networks to try to meet the public Wi-Fi demand that we have, um, dis distributed internet providers. Uh, so we're actively seeking to transform our infrastructure to become a smart city. And we're seeking help from vendors and, and uh, other smart people like yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even know where to start. We're doing so many things in the city of San Jose. But we, we, we have, um, I personally have requested an increase in our license plate readers for parking enforcement so that we can catch, uh, you know, cars that have been stolen much more quickly than we currently are. Uh, we have the street light. Uh, we, we, we've done a lot of street uh, work where, where we actually set priorities and allow our fire department to push a button so that they can they can go through the red lights a little faster and get to the people who need their help the most um, more quickly. So we have a signal priority for uh, emergency vehicles and now light rail. I, I personally led that effort to make sure that along first fleet anyway, light rail will have signal priority. We have facial recognition at the airport that speeds, speeds along uh, the um, international, uh, the people coming in from international destinations, it speeds up their their customs, uh, you know, when they go through customs, it, it helps, they don't have to type in anything. Uh, we have the largest implementation of 5G technology in any large city in, in the United States. 
We have approved more than 4,000 antennas to be placed on our street lights and are leasing them to vendors uh, like AT&T and Verizon. We've made agreements with them and with the revenues that we're generating from those agreements, we're providing free, uh, uh, free Wi-Fi connectivity to our less fortunate areas and helping kids uh, close the digital divide. Uh, so those are some of the programs that, that we are doing in the city of San Jose. I can go on, but uh, we, we seem to be trying things, and I don't want to say that everything works, because we've tried some new software for our building and planning department that didn't work out. So not everything that we've tried has worked, and I want to be clear that uh, if, cities, if cities embark on these things, it's not always a win. Uh, it, sometimes you have trouble implementing these new things, and it's, it's a risk that you have to take as an elected official to invest in technology that sometimes doesn't work out and uh, you have to be brave enough to do it. And so, and that's, and that's a challenge that we have constantly, figuring out if a project is worth doing and then going forward on it. But we have a lot of projects going on. Thank you, Council Member. So um, this is my last question because we wanted to have some time um, to have the audience ask some questions as well. Um, so all of us up here at some point, including myself, we're in the business of serving the public, right? And you talk about some of these really incredible technologies, initiatives, and programs that the city are doing. Uh, my question is, how, how, do, how do you engage citizens in this initiative? And are they uh, receptive to it? What are some of the challenges that you encounter uh, just, you know, delivering these types of services to the public and also making sure that um, citizens' input are being incorporated in your initiative. We can start with uh, Council Member Fon. All right, there we go. Um, so how We're going to start with the, with the Council Member to your right, real quick, the young gentleman sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's sad because, yeah, it's okay. You're sort of on this side, so I thought you said that side. Okay. He's really excited. Okay. He's really excited. Go for it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think reaching out to the community is really important. Um, it can either you know, make or break as some of your initiatives there. Um, what we, how we approach it is uh, we would uh, do a community-oriented uh, process in terms of our priority setting, um, and as well as um, our budget. Um, we've worked with consultants on, um, in terms of getting uh, feedback from, from the community in terms of polling them, um, doing uh, surveys there. Um, and, and we have a uh, PIO, a public information officer, that uh, uh, does public information uh, on an outreach on um, social media uh, and uh, platforms like Mexico. Um, so when it came down to it, I'll give you an example. Um, when we're, uh, we're talking about um, the security cameras and the license plate readers, um, some community members uh, were concerned in terms of their right to privacy. So um, figuring out how to address that ahead um, before it even gets to um, you know our council meetings uh, is really important because um, our police department worked really closely with um, neighborhood residents uh, and ensuring them that um, you know. Uh, the data that's collected, it won't be stored. Um, and I think that was really important. And uh, at the end of the day, it's just um, you know, being ahead of, um, you know, everything one, one step ahead at, at all times and just um, getting a feel of how the public is going to react. Thank you. Mayor Bouchard. Okay, so this is about how the uh, uh, Scissor groups, but they're embracing the technologies. Yeah. Okay, so I love being on panels with, uh, with New Armage because he always reminds me of all the great things that are going on. So, uh, so yes, we have. Uh, we also have a smartphone app, uh, and and one of the things that we've learned is that one size doesn't fit all. We've got a large range of, of ages. We've got people in Livermore that don't have computers. Uh, we've got people that are on. The instant technology. So we have people that are on next door. Uh, we have uh, uh, we're on those platforms next door. Facebook. Uh, so we're not only 
uh, having had people pull information, but we're pushing information out of the communities. Uh, we also have a smartphone app, which gives people the ability to uh, tap into the city uh, on a real-time basis. If there is graffiti, if there's a pothole, if there's a problem with the city, uh, they can access the city uh, either by sending me an email and I'll respond, or they've got the smartphone app where they can directly contact the people that can uh, they can solve those problems. Uh, we've got the uh, uh, also the smart uh, the license plate readers, so in real time we can see when uh, somebody comes into our community uh, and they might be coming into the community to do good things. So the public does embrace this because they feel the importance of public safety. That's the number one priority in our city: public safety uh, and security. So people, we just had a poll. Ninety-five percent of the people that were polled feel that Livermore is a safe place to live and raise a family. So these are uh, initiatives that we've got, very popular, uh, and uh, uh, it gives an opportunity to have those people feel that they are engaged and make a difference in their community. Thank you. You know, I remember a story from Jack Ma, the uh, founder of Al Alibaba. He's one of the richest men in China. And one of the things that he said is in 1995 when he came here, he saw a computer and he didn't want to touch it because he thought he was going to break it. Uh, there's a very technology, and there, that's definitely true on that. Uh, when we started pushing policies like such as the uh, uh, public Wi-Fi, folks were concerned about what that meaning of public Wi-Fi was, and why are we getting different free Wi-Fi out? Well, you know, I remember years ago when I had to go to school, uh, and when I had to research, I had to go to the library, and the library was a mile and a half away from my house. I used to stay at the library all the way until it closed at 9 a.m. This is when I lived in San Francisco. And uh, as a kid who was like 11 or 12 years old, that's not good to go travel the city. The internet has basically freed those uh, domains because we have so much content, our libraries don't even have near the content of the internet. And you think about it, back then when I had to go to school, if I didn't have that pencil, I would fail. Today, our kids have to do all their homework online, they have to read their books online, so without that internet, they will fail. So that's why uh, those are the messages and stories that I share with uh, uh, constituents on why that is important. We, the city of San Leandro actually gave four strands of fiber to all of the school district, and now we have the fastest school district with a 40 gig network. Uh, our school district actually has jumped ahead and actually made it our school the safest schools. They recently just installed 800 cameras to basically ensure the safety of the of the, of the kids, not just only from you know uh, detecting fights or uh, issues with with the uh, students, but also uh, risk mitigation from like active shooters. They're really uh, pushing the envelope to be engaged. The fiber uh, fiber initiative was really focused on the on the businesses, but we have to also look at the next level, which is how do we connect our homes to high-speed internet, because that's going to be the next generation. So we have to have those discussions. We have to have the discussions with the regions. We have to have the discussions with our uh, providers. And we also have to have the discussions with the entrepreneurs who want to give us affordable fiber or affordable high-speed internet, because if we can get that, them into every single house, we can really bridge that divide. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me rephrase the question that you were asking is to have the, the question uh, is uh, how, do, how, how, does, uh, how do citizens embrace the technologies or the initiatives that you have uh, in place and were there challenges in, in terms of getting them to be included in what some of those initiatives are? So um, the technology wise, uh, I think uh, my town citizen are, I would say we're not an early adopter. I can say that um, we probably on the golf, the, what they call the golf gym more. If you have the golf bar, we're probably on the later side. The challenge in, for uh, our town is that the, we don't have any commercial uh, entity. We don't have school and libraries. So we, all we have like is the residential. So how are we going to promote the technology into the residential home? That's basically come down to the internet connection. That's pretty much what we have. The ALPR, Automatic License Reader, I actually uh, boldly brought up to the council meeting without having a survey and I said, let's do it. That was when I was still like a fresh <laughs> and experienced. And we have half of the residents say, yes, let's do it. And the other half uh, said, no, we don't want it. So what happened is we decided to just push it off. 
then the town sheriff and figure out how solution this is what I mentioned earlier. So they have the ELPR installed in their vehicle instead of on the street. Um, and that's how we kind of reach out to kind of like compromise half of the residents' concern that we have on the um, on the vehicle that is not uh, invading any privacy. The other half to say, okay, we have something reasonable that we can move forward. Um, to reach out to the citizen, I would say we use mostly the online uh, survey form, next door, survey monkey. And I myself, uh, lots of times, just being very nosy, walk around and just randomly poke on the residents. So what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And then just kind of hear from everybody what the people uh, say and what people think about it. And that's how I get a sense of what my community desire and what they really want regarding the technology. Thank you. And I think, um, I didn't mention, we, we originally had a problem with uh, internet uh, access. Uh, we had one single provider, no mention who they were. And cities used to have this problem. We would sign these exclusive agreements, which would really to our detriment of our citizens, competitiveness, the cost, and the quality of service. We found a loophole because for five years, this particular national known company screwed around so much to be blunt. Um, they lost the right, we opened it up, and we ended up with three, four different providers. We made a partnership, public-private partnership, with AT&T as the second city in the United States where they wanted to test a new program called Uverse. And it had the promise of all this high-speed internet and all this great capability. It gave us a community access channel. It gave us, as a city, a lot of robust data. Uh, and in terms of how Republic, the public wanted absolutely competitive, they didn't like the other company. What they didn't like was the, these equipment cabinets that were going to show up in their neighborhoods. And so we came up with a program and then worked with them, and that was our biggest problem. The second thing that happened in the year 2000, culturally our community, and uh, as well as John's, and the Tri-Valley really changed in 2000. Our community was about 18% Asian. Our school district today is 44% Asian. And it was a big cultural change over a very short period of time. So the values, the expectations, our way to respond to our citizens had to change a lot. And it's actually turned out to be really well. And, and we were one of those communities, and I've all heard and read about the paper all the day, about them. putting a new technology and how do your citizens like it. We used to be the 10th to 15th safest city in the state of California. We're now the number one state in, in the state of California for one reason. And our chief of police would like to say it because we have all the best police officers, but he'll be honest and say it's because we install the most robust license plate reader system with a robust database and situational high definition awareness camera system that you cannot get physically in or out anywhere in our community without that being picked up. We also put it, installed it in every single one of our police cars. Why would you do that in the mobile? Our car could be driving down a road at 40 miles an hour. It sees a car parked, it sees it in the driveway, sees a car driving. It will say there's a warrant out for arrest for that owner of that car. In the first 72 hours, we picked up on Thanksgiving morning, unfortunately, a gentleman was visiting relatives in Danville, had a million dollar warrant for a murder arrest. It changed how we do business. We had burglaries that within two hours, somebody had said, I saw a white car in my neighborhood. That's all they could tell us, a white car. We could put it in the system. The database is so robust. Just put it, excuse me, cars. White cars, in the past 15 minutes, one car pops up, eliminate the Daniel addresses, let's use some probable causes. That car, four hours later, was found in Stockton, California. Stockton PD we made a call that went over, saw the car, the stolen goods were in the back seat. Not one person showed up in our community when we held public hearings to deploy this information. And it's obviously our demographics are different, but even though culturally we have changed a lot, we have this, this immigrant population of very well-educated people. Their expectation is, duh, why aren't you using the technology? So in our case, and again, because we're small, we have 160 miles, 18, 160 miles of roads, 18 square miles, it really paid off. Well. And, and, and again, is it, could you deploy it on the, on the scale of San Jose or Berkeley? Those are big cities with a lot bigger problems. 
but in our case, at least test the validity of the system. And I think those are the lessons you can probably learn from a small system. Thank you. Pass over. Well, that is super interesting. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, the, it, it, in, in my community, that would not fly, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we have a strong, strong spirit of, um, of freedom. And uh, it, 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 you know, <laughs> it would be difficult. Uh, we Because we did have tremendous pushback regarding um, uh, just sort of the basic life plate reader for parking. Um, and, and as a result, the city crafted a privacy policy uh, to, to handle all the data the city collects around the city. Um, <laughs> interesting how that will evolve over time. Uh, but you know, in terms of uh, community engagement, getting citizen input is super important, uh, especially in some of these cities here where your citizens are uh, well educated and, and involved and engaged. Uh, it's imperative that you get their input, and oftentimes their input can help inform the process to make the project better. Um, but I think getting, getting people's buy-in uh, has traditionally been, been doable if you have a good reason why. And so often we have to, you know, we really dig into the reason why we're rolling out a technology. What is the purpose? So I've heard safety on two fronts there. Really, the school is really interesting as well. I hadn't thought of that. Um, so, safe, so safety and giving reasons why and, and engagement and helping small businesses grow, those have all worked and resilience, and now we're moving into uh, fire awareness. We have, a, we have a real need to address uh, sea level rise and fire awareness. And we have, we have uh, two significant areas of the city that are, that are threatened by fire and by sea level rise. So uh, those areas are particularly interested in technologies being used to address those, those real needs. So that's all I've got to say on that. Thank you. Councilman <laughs> Chemist. Yeah, it's interesting that, that nobody goes in and out of, that, of, your, of your city. I try to implement um, metal detectors at the top of those stairs. Um, I've gotten huge resistance on that, <laughs> if you saw the newspapers. Uh, <laughs> I forgot my change today. Yes, uh, you can bring as many chains as you want here. Uh, yeah, I, and uh, so, so we're very resistant. I think there's a lot of resistance to uh, surveillance technologies, uh, uh, like I said, I've been quoted many times, but uh, we do definitely care about what people think. Uh, in, 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 in assessing our needs, we go out annually every year during budget season, which is this, this season that we're in, and the mayor conducts meetings all over the city, usually one in each district. We also do a poll, a regular paid poll, to find out what people's top interests are, and we have an online portal where people can take an online survey. So we do try to find out the top needs of the community uh, before we before we make decisions about things. Uh, other than that, we, 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 have, uh, we, we also have uh, technology that people have been interested in. We do have this thing called the My San Jose app that we've been using for several years. And we just found out that people with, uh, you know, Spanish and and, um, and Vietnamese languages would, would prefer that they would be like that be translated into their languages, and so we're working on that. Those are those are uh, those are suggestions from the public, and we get them all the time. Uh, we, you know, we get them from our constituents. You know, we uh, I think each council member represents a hundred thousand people. We send out a newsletter every every month, and on every one of those newsletters, I usually get ten or fifteen suggestions. Uh, when, when, when we get those newsletters back. So there's a, a variety of different ways that we do outreach in the community. Uh, each council member has his or her own style. My personal style is I actually like to get out in the community. I have my community office hours at coffee shops where people can come in without appointments and talk to me um, twice a month. And so those are the things that we do to reach out to our citizens to see what they their needs are. But, um, but oftentimes, uh, when, when we propose things, there's usually a big fight here, and sometimes this whole chamber fills up with people who have an opinion one way or the other on these topics. I, I, it, it may sound like Danville, though. You mentioned 4G, 5G, and Danville. It's standing room only with police in our chamber. Very small, very vocal, with all the great things that we've done in technology. It's like we are the devil bringing something that's going to kill all of our residents. And it's it's really challenging, and it's going to hurt our future. 
Well, thank you very much. We just have to feel better that we do have our problems. I know that earlier I said that we have time uh, for questions from the audience. Unfortunately, we don't, and I want to be very respectful of everyone's time. Uh, there is a luncheon in the rotunda. I know that some of these elected officials must get to. Uh, so um, they will be around. It's lunch. Uh, I think you should feel free to ask them any questions that you have. But once again, let's give all these elected officials, uh, especially the mayors of different cities, a round of applause for being here today with us.